All right. Let's get this party started. Uh, so if, if, I'm, if I make jokes, I think this is something that's actually quite common across cultures on this beautiful continent of ours. Uh, so, like, Africans deal with incredible adversity with humor. We see that in South Africa a lot. Um, if, if my jokes do not resonate with everybody watching, understand it's just <laughs> my dark journalist humor combined with our uh, typical South Africanness of how we handle things like load shedding and state capture. Um, we, we laugh in the face of adversity lest we cry. Um, but please don't take joking and lightheartedness for making light of how serious this is. Um, the, the title is Attention Grabbing, It Is Not Hyperbole in the Slightest. Afrinic is in deep flippin' trouble. Before we get going, some disclaimers. Um, there are people in this room, uh, is this good? Do I need to stand closer to this thing? Because is this good over here, as long as there's no feedback. <clears throat> um, there are people in this room that know an awful lot more than I do about specific topics, and hopefully they can add their expertise. But there are also lawyers involved. Uh, there's an incredible amount of litigation, and so not everybody can speak their minds. And that's where I have the best job, uh, because I can say things that other people can't necessarily. This is only current as of yesterday. Uh, this is an incredibly fast-moving situation, and so what I say here right now could very well change in the next 12 hours. We'll see. And then, uh, obligatory, these opinions expressed, blah, 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 batteries not included. Um, so, and before we, we kick off completely, so for the folks who are watching online, and especially in Mauritius right now, at Afrinec, thank you very, very much for staying the course, for continuing to slog it out in an incredibly demoralizing environment, for continuing to make sure that things tick over and work. Um, those of us who know what's going on really appreciate you. Please keep doing that. With that out the way, let's see if we can fix this thing. This is one of my favorite lines from The Big Short. Truth is like poetry. And most people fucking hate poetry. <laughs> That's one of the great things uh, uh, that I get to do with uh, in my job, is I get to seek the truth, I get to look at the truth, and I get to uh, proclaim the truth um, uh, whenever possible. Um, so, uh, or, or uh, as, uh, to the best of my ability. Because the thing is, there's a massive information asymmetry here. And so, in that sense, this is the truth based on the facts at hand. So, um, because this is being broadcast, and um, uh, Zanog and Ispa are recording this, and they probably want to put this on their YouTube channel, I, I want to propose something. So, whatever I say, fair game. Attribute it to me, uh, it's, it's me saying it in my personal capacity as the reporter who has been looking into this for uh, for uh, many years. That's fine. But when we have the discussion at the end, I would like to propose Chatham, the Chatham House rule. So the Chatham House rule is, when a meeting or part thereof is held under the Chatham House rule, participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. Um, are there any journalists, bloggers, podcasters, YouTubers, Twitch streamers, TikTokers in this room that want to be able to attribute what is discussed afterwards? Or can we hold to the Chatham House rule? So that includes people who are going to be able to participate from the live stream. Uh, you don't get a say. The people in the room get a say, unfortunately, and you have to abide by what the people in the room decide. Is, are there any objections to, the to applying the Chatham House rule to the discussion afterwards? Okay, unanimous agreement. We'll um, I'll also just remind everybody afterwards. So how broken is Afrinic? Very broken. And I'll try to do a quick recap. Show of hands, has anybody seen John Curran's update on the current status from Nanog two weeks ago? Okay, 
So that means I get to do what he's done, which is provide a quick update, but I get to do it in much less flowery language. Love John Kieran. He is a case study in how to speak uh, the truth and how to s give an update when you're under constant threat of being sued. <laughs> Um, if, if you want uh, an object lesson on how to handle uh, a, a difficult situation like that, uh, he's very careful with his language, very careful with his wording. You have to infer a lot and collect, connect a lot of dots. I have the benefit of not having to do that. So let's call a spade a shovel. So where this starts for me is um, around 2019, a Californian internet investigator named Ron Gilmet contacts me and says, hey, listen, I think I've uncovered something pretty freaking shady at Afrinic. And uh, I'm not going to take you through the, the whole um, blow by blow. Bottom line is we ultimately catch uh, Afrinic's number two employee, Ernest Bayuranga, stealing IPv4 addresses from the free pool and leasing them as an IP broker. Uh, then there's a whole separate uh, part of this um, that involves other individuals where they uh, hijacked a bunch of legacy IP address blocks belonging to South African institutions that includes government agencies, companies, what eventually became CETA, um, and uh, using those, leasing those out, uh, essentially. And so uh, the leg for, for those who don't know, legacy IP address space is IP address space that you don't have to pay Afrinic a membership fee for. Uh, so you, um, it's incredibly valuable in that sense. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, that, this, that's where this starts. So um, rather than focus on dealing with that and reclaiming the stolen address blocks, I think the, the address blocks stolen by Ernest uh, was relatively easy because we had uh, compiled like a whole dossier on, on what had happened and Afrinic was able to uh, augment that data with their own internal data. No problem, reclaim that address space. It was put in like a hold, um, but uh, everything suggests Ernest was not alone, right? So, uh, so you have to find out what else had been stolen and reclaim that. And uh, then the legacy address space stuff is incredibly hairy to deal with because there's people in that space using it right now who don't know that they've bought stolen space. And uh, you have to reclaim it from people who are, uh, who, who are not, who, you know, who uh, Ernest was like, you've caught me. Uh, police charges were laid against him. He was fired and the address space was reclaimed. The legacy IP address space involves um, uh, people not on the African, uh, one guy who's not on the African continent and one foreign national who, as far as we know, is actually resident in South Africa. Um, and, uh, but untying that, or untangling that is much harder because those guys might sue you and one of them in fact has, uh, uh, you know, uh, instituted legal action against Afrinic, which he ultimately lost. Um, but that alone would have been a task on its own. And rather than focus on that, what Afrinic did is they went after an, uh, a resource member called Cloud Innovation. So they, they decide that they're going to bite off another big chunk that they obviously couldn't chew. And Cloud Innovation rallies its allies uh, and associates that, and it ultimately brings Afrinic to its knees. Now, Lest it be said that I'm casting Cloud Innovation as the bad guy, uh, put yourself in Cloud Innovation's shoes. Before I tell you anything else about Cloud Innovation, you own IP addresses, the, 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 the ISPs in the room, the, everybody else in the room who's a resource member at Afrinet, and they threaten to take your resources away for whatever reason, all of it, by the way, not just reclaim what you're not using, they take it all back. What would you do? Right, so with that, in, with that in mind, let's explore a little bit what, what's happened here. And hopefully you'll come to realize, as I have, that there's, there, there are very few bad guys in this story. Like, uh, there's, there's, there's just people. There's people doing bad things. There's people doing good things. But it's just people looking out for their own self-interest. Why go after cloud innovation? 
I think that table, for anybody who, who knows IPs, explains a lot. Cloud innovation is sitting on a ton of space. Two slash 12s, two slash 11s, and um, I worked out the street value based on $50 per IP. That's 314 million US. For those who want to work in RAND, multiply by, where are we today, 18.8, .8, multiply by 19. You're talking billions of RANDs of, of asset, right? That's also incentive for why cloud innovation fought tooth and nail to protect it. It's, it's a huge thing that it's sitting on. And uh, what, um, what Jeff was speaking about earlier today was actually quite encouraging. As we, as we start talking about what's happening in IPv4 and IPv6, um, you know, the, the, the natural progression of what's happening there um, might actually feed into a solution of, um, of what happens here at the end of the day. Okay, so cloud innovation sits on a ton of resources. Now, it's more than a rumor uh, how cloud innovation got these resources. The, the founder of cloud innovation and Laris, uh, his name is Lou Heng. Uh, he, uh, he and I have spoken at length multiple times. I've actually put the question to him because it's basically an open secret in the industry that cloud innovation um, applied for these addresses on the, on the, uh, the for, and the reasons it gave, because when you apply for IPs from Afrinic, you have to give reasons. The reasons he gave was he is essentially going to use these as to provide VPN services to people in mainland China so that they can punch through the Great Firewall. For, for those of us in Africa, that's a very noble cause. Um, uh, on, China not in, uh, on China mainland, not so much. Um, but that means that whoever approved these resources knew that these resources were not going to be used in Africa. They were going to be used overseas for a good cause. Um, now, uh, what happens, it, uh, there's a huge amount of consternation over this huge chunk of address space that just gets assigned to a guy um, who's launched the company technically in the Afri African region, it's in the Seychelles, um, and uh, who, by all account, like he's, he's, he's quite open about it, he's not African, he's, he's a Chinese national, um, and so this causes huge friction in the, in the community. And we'll talk a little bit about like, those uh, geographic and cultural frictions that exist in the community because I think it's important to understand those while we discuss solutions. Um, okay, so what happens is cloud innovation, I'm gonna now try to speed run this because we have to get to the discussion at the end, that's the meat and potatoes. So cloud innovation gets its first slash 12 in 2013, the rest of its resources in 2014. Within a few years though, cloud innovation is leasing these addresses. And, and it's unclear where the VPN service went. Um, but uh, it's not doing it directly. So there's a new company launched called Laris Cloud Services Limited sometime in 2016 or 2017. But, and there's an arm's length relationship between cloud innovation and Laris. They, they refer to one another as partners. But Liu Heng founded both. It's the same thing. Um, when, when you cut through it all. So uh, what I do know in terms of the timeline, 2016 versus 2017, is the Laris um, org record, org LCSL1 Afrinic, was created on 19 January 2017. So if you want a timeline, it's, it's roughly then. Then in uh, 2020, Afrinic sends out essentially what, what's a cease and desist, um, or a warning to go, we are gonna take back your um, your, as your, your resources unless you can explain to us how you're using it. Uh, very abridged. But essentially, Afrinic alleged three things. Cloud innovations, who has records, do not match how the IPs are used. Cloud innovation is no longer using its IP address blocks for the reasons it gave when it applied for them. And most of the address space was being used outside the Afrinic region. Um, now, uh, uh, cloud innovation, for its part, uh, disputed keeping who is, uh, disputed the who is record allegation. It says it keeps its who is records more up to date than most. Um, uh, I, I could not find much fault with that statement. Um, if I compare how uh, Laris and Cloud Innovation handles its who is affairs versus the average South African ISP. Uh, this, it also disputed the, the fact that it was no longer using its address space for the reasons it gave when it applied for them, like disputed it outright. 
um, and then also said that there was, by the way, there's no mechanism to tell Afrinic that I'm using it for a different purpose now. Right, and uh, then the third one, it said that, it, it said that there was no Afrinic policy blocking the address space from being used outside the Afrinic region. And that's true until now, until we uh, reach soft landing. So uh, Afrinic is now in its last slash eight. There's a new policy for that specifically, which says that there's like a whole complicated thing about like you can use it out there, but it has to like link back to Africa, blah, 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 blah. Um, but until the last slash eight, you could use your resources however you liked. And, uh, and so there's really only one leg that I can see for Afrinic to stand on. And that's in the resource services agreement that everybody has to sign, the RSA. There is a line in there that says that you have to use the resources for the reasons stipulated. Now, as I said, I've had very long conversations with Liu Heng in the past, and he has refused to confirm or deny whether indeed the, he, uh, he, he got these addresses um, with the motivation that they would be used for VPN services. Um, so uh, there's, there's no documentary evidence about what he applied for these addresses for, but there are witnesses in this room who will sign affidavits attesting to the fact that Liu Heng indeed applied for these resources to launch VPN services. For whatever that's worth, it might be a moot point in, in the courts at the end of the day. Um, but um, so what I'm trying to say is the Afrinic potentially had a leg to stand on, but there's also plenty of resource members in this room who will go, yeah, but if they go for cloud innovation, even though that is a lot of space, they could come for me next, even though I've, you know, I've got a much smaller amount of space. If you, uh, if you apply the law of universality and you say what's good for the goose is good for the gander, that's a potential problem because Afrinic could come for your resources next. And so um, that creates a, um, a, a kind of a band of people with vested interests, even though they might be diametrically opposed in ideology. So uh, Cloud Innovation responds to Afrinic's threat with a disparaging letter, essentially accusing them of not knowing what the hell they're doing, and uh, followed it up with an application for an injunction in the Mauritian courts on 13 July 2020. Now, I want to illustrate something a little bit about how the Mauritian courts work. After hearing the case, the court only set the application aside almost a year later, 7 July. It took a year to hear an injunction in the Mauritian courts. Okay. And uh, we'll get to some more stuff later on. And then as luck would have it, luck, maybe more than luck, but um, let's not assume anything. As luck would have it, the Afrinic board was sitting that very uh, week. Uh, over the 7th and the 8th of July for a board meeting. And um, it adjourned, just for like a little bit of uh, detail. Um, on the, uh, they started the meeting at nine on the 7th of July. Um, it ran until after one, and then there were complaints that this meeting was running far too long. So they adjourned until the next day. It was during, on the 7th that the court hands down um, the, the judgment in the, in the interdict application. It dismisses the interdict. So Cloud Innovation loses. The very next day, the Afrinic board resolves, we are taking away Cloud Innovation's resources. They issue a public statement to that effect, and faced with the prospect of seeing his multi-million dollar business go up in smoke, uh, Liu Heng Cloud Innovation um, launches an all-out assault on Afrinic. What does an all-out assault on Afrinic look like? Jan, once again, are you speaking in hyperbole here? Uh, Afrinic has a list of uh, court cases on its website. I apologize if you give anybody motion sickness. If you get any motion sickness, wave your hands. A microphone, sorry. Uh, yes, people are trying to uh, listen in. So uh, this thing will loop forever um, so that you guys can see what I'm talking about when I'm talking about lawfare. Um, where does it stop? 59. Uh, and there's more. There's, there, there are cases that are not listed on this. And um, if you go through that, um, then, uh, so, so the first thing that happens in the opening salvo between Cloud Innovation and Afrinic, <laughs> Cloud Innovation is able to get a court order in Mauritius that locks Afrinic out of its bank account. It locked Afrinic out of its bank account for two and a half months. It did this by, with a damages claim. So first it files a damages claim. It says Afrinic owes me 50 million in damages for what it's about to do or for what it's doing to me. Right? Then it files a garnish for, for, for an application for a garnish order. 
The garnishay order does not hear the merits of the case. It is granted under what they term at own risk and perils, which means that the enforcing party, in this case Cloud Innovation, can serve the garnishay order on Afrinix Bank, um, and if there's any, um, if it's found that it's done so improperly or whatever the case might be, then Afrinix, maybe the bank, can sue Cloud Innovation in return, because it's at, essentially the court is saying, we're not saying you can do this, um, we're, you know, but we've got a mechanism for you to attach the assets to make sure Afrinic doesn't rabbit with it, which uh, was incredibly low risk, but you know, be that as it may, that's why this mechanism exists. Um, and, but like, if, there's any, if there's anything wrong with what you've told us, if there's anything wrong with the way this application was handled, if there's anything wrong with how you implemented this garnishé order, you're on the hook for it. But Cloud Innovation is a company registered in the Seychelles. Like, its liability in Mauritius is incredibly limited. Um, and so there is no risk and perils. <laughs> it, it can essentially do this at will because the, the, the chance of facing consequences for doing so improperly is incredibly low. Um, and, but uh, uh, this uh, comes back to later when we need to discuss um, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what approach, if we're gonna fix this, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? All right, so Afrinix drowned in, in, in legislation, and this lawfare is like a thing of technicalities. How does, how does Afrinix get out, get its bank account back? Is it, it, it launches a counter application to say that the power of attorney that Cloud Innovation signed for its lawyer in Mauritius was wrong. The court says, yeah, that's right, and it voids the Garnaché order. Um, two and a half months later, but at least that's shorter than a year. Right? And like the, the, this whole thing, it's like a battle of these technicalities uh, between the parties. So um, if you, and now if you scroll through this, you'll see that there's like a lot of, there's like a lot of things that look positive. It says applica application withdrew, we won, uh, application set aside. It looks like Afrinic is winning. Afrinic is not winning, not in the slightest, because where it matters, it's lost. So where Afrinix stands today, it is headless, it is rudderless. The, the, there's no one in the organization who can, who's empowered to make uh, strategic decisions. So the staff who are working there, that's why I thank them for what they're doing. Um, because they're doing so under incredibly difficult circumstances. Um, essentially what happened was, at the, at, uh, as this uh, grew to a crescendo, is um, Afrinix was about to hold elections because the, uh, how, how Afrinic works is it's a member, members-based, members supposed to be a members-driven organization. So the directorship is, um, unlike corporates that you might be familiar with, they are elected. Um, sort of like a board of trustees at a, at, at a sectional title here in South Africa. So um, the, 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 the trustees are separated by geographic region. There are some who exist without region, and then the membership vote on who they want to see as their candidate. And um, they were about to have this vote, and this got so ugly. And I think it's important to understand the quagmire that is Afrinic elections if we're going to talk about long-term solutions for this, right? So um, uh, th uh, this most recent election, there were um, uh, incredibly uh, serious, let's just use the word serious, allegations about uh, what Liu Heng was doing behind the scenes. So uh, the, the, um, th there's uh, several parties allege that Cloud Innovation, but not directly, so not Liu Heng directly, but a, a sister organization of a sister organization was essentially buying people's votes. There are several people who will testify to this, by the way. Um, but essentially, the allegation was that, um, that the, uh, the organization that was representing Liu Heng's interest and Cloud Innovation's interest um, wanted people to sign over their MyAfrinic portal login details so that they could cast the vote. The reason for that, by the way, is because there were allegations that there were previously uh, attempts at vote buying and that, uh, that these guys wanted them to vote along. Um, and so this time around, it's like, no, you have to give us your MyAfrinic login details, we'll cast the vote, 
um, and, and, you know, in exchange for money. Now, Liu Heng has denied this vehemently. Liu Heng has said it, the, the accusation that he is trying to buy votes is stupid because it's unaffordable. Like, it is, it is too much money. Um, but the evidence to the contrary, I must say, is overwhelming. Uh, there are just so many people who have said independently, people who are not active members, who are not on mailing lists, who do not deal with Afrinic every day, who are like, what is this email I got that's offering me money to vote according to a certain line? And so, um, you know, what exactly has happened there, uh, unfortunately, we don't know yet. But the counter to this, by the way, <laughs> is that there is a group inside Afrinic that pretty much, they don't buy votes, but they, they cook the elections, is the allegation. And so there, there are these two camps that have, there's actually more, may, way more than two camps in Afrinic. There's probably like four, five, six camps. But these, these warring camps um, th that kind of made it unpalatable for everybody else to be there, um, uh, were essentially, the, the, the one was manipulating Afrinic policy and uh, sometimes just violating policy, allegedly, um, to ensure that certain candidates were not even on the ballot. And on the other side, you have people who are going, well, we need to win this thing at all costs, and allegedly bought votes. And so the, the, the elections get ugly. The Cloud Innovation uh, launches another injunction application um, uh, against Afrinic because of the, uh, the fact that none of Cloud Innovation's preferred candidates e were even allowed on the ballot. And the court ruled in Cloud Innovation's favor, said Afrinic violated its policies. And so the election couldn't happen. And then board members' um, uh, uh, tenures started running out. And so uh, all of the, like uh, one board member can't continue, next board member can't continue, and now the board is incorate. Uh, and so, and crucially, uh, before I make everybody seasick, let's, let's just uh, move the, the, stop the slide there for a second. Um, crucially, and this has been, if, if, by the way, there are plenty of people in the room who uh, tried to warn Afrinic that this was coming that if, if you don't get credit today, uh, uh, we don't have time to go through it all, and I don't want to miss anybody out who, who has also silently contributed. Uh, there, there have been a few vocal people, but there are also people who've worked behind the scenes warning diligently. Afrinic's policies are not well thought out. They need to be revised. You're going to run into trouble. Um, uh, the, the, the hiring of the former CEO, Eddie Kaihura, who, by the way, is a great guy, um, was similarly mired in controversy um, because there was an allegation, for example, um, in the Afrinic bylaws, it says that the CEO cannot be from the same country in which Afrinic is registered, right? Mauritius in this case. So in other words, no Mauritian is allowed to be an Afrinic CEO. That is in direct con um, uh, conflict with Mauritius's own laws on, uh, on, on uh, equity, on hiring equity in the country. And so, um, uh, if, you, if you wanted to attack, that's another avenue on which you can attack Afrinic. Right? So, in, like, Afrinic was doing such a bad job of guarding its flanks that it just left, it had these gaping holes in its policies that allowed clown innovation to just drive straight through them. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, uh, essentially do whatever it needed to do to ensure that Afrinic couldn't essentially torpedo its whole business. And so um, the, the, uh, uh, the situation with the elections we've covered, um, then uh, the, the, the two punch of the one-two punch is that uh, another application comes and says the board cannot act cannot make decisions as the board while they are in Corate. Afrinic needs an election. And the, the board uh, needs to be reconstituted, become Corate, and the organization must continue uh, within the guidelines of its own policies. So there's another failure of Afrinic policy. Why in the hell is there no way to reboot the thing? 
if your, if your um, number of directors falls under quorum, if you, you just go look through basic things like the Sectional Title Act in South Africa, there's always a way to recover. How is there no self-recovery mechanism built in? And once again, Afrinic was warned about this repeatedly. And, um, but there was no one with the incentive to ever test the policies. And so people just like, you know, ran roughshod over these policies, like uh, just, you know, carried on as if nothing was wrong um, until the one day you try to take someone's $300 million asset away and all of a sudden he has all the incentive in the world to um, like rip the, your, your, uh, the holes in your policies to shreds. And so before you want to tackle something like this, so fair game, if, if Afrinic wants to test in court and through its policies where the cloud innovations allocations were done improperly, that's fair. That's fair to do, but your house needs to be in order before you, before you do that, because otherwise this happens. All right, so, um, the, so that was the final paralyzing blow to Afrinec, and so there's now no board, no CEO, the CEO's contract ran out, and so there's two potential narratives here. The one is that there was an avenue to extend Eddie Kaihura's contract, and they didn't take it. And the other one was that, no, there's like after that uh, application to say the board can't do anything, the board can't appoint a new CEO um, or extend the current CEO's contract. So, um, and so uh, there were varying legal opinions on this and ultimately the legal opinion that said Eddie has to leave and leave Afrinic without a CEO, um, that, that legal opinion went out. And off goes Eddie, which was the last backstop because there's certain things in Afrinex bylaws that allows the CEO to do things while the board is being reconstituted, and now there's no one with that executive power. Okay, so, based uh, in receivership, that happened on the 12th of September, 2023. Receivership is not a bankruptcy pr proceeding, right? So people might associate that with business rescue um, or liquidation. This was an, essentially an administrator that was appointed to with the exclusive purpose of reconstituting the board and making sure that there's an election uh, and, and that the board is reconstituted based on the elections in line with Afrinic's policies as written. Uh, then, the, but the receiver was to hold the elections within six months. That would have been yesterday. And we might have had a very different conversation here today. But, uh, a former Afrinic board member and a guy who managed to convince the Mauritian courts that he can act as the chair, we haven't quite figured out how that's happened. Um, his name's Benjamin Eshun. He wrangled a stay. So uh, without uh, boring you with the technicalities, you can watch John Curran's uh, brilliant update on, on how we got here. Um, but it's, it was, once again, Mauritian court. It was an injunction with a counter injunction and a counter counter injunction, status quo, and um, as far as I know right now, the receiver is stayed permanently until something else happens. So Afrinic is back stuck in limbo and a former board member at Afrinic orchestrated it for, for it to be that way. And that raises serious questions um, about what the game is here. Because um, despite their differences, right? The, uh, the, the, despite the differences between uh, resource members who are aggrieved with the amount of resources cloud innovation was given, who might not like Lu Heng, um, uh, whatever the case might be, there was a broad agreement amongst resource members with say, with a huge amount of say in Afrinic. Um, one might even say the majority of the vote who said that the receiver was a very good thing. A very good thing. And uh, in one fell swoop, that's been undone. Well, I said one fell swoop. It happened over months in the Mauritian courts. Um, and uh, something that the majority agreed was good is, is now blocked. And so um, uh, Benjamin Eshun, uh, also during this, he asked the Supreme Court to appoint three directors to call an AGMM. So Benjamin's um, alternative to having the receiver do the election is he wants the court to appoint three directors I don't know on what basis he wanted that done because Mauritian court documents are sealed. Unlike in South Africa where they are public, 
Um, in Mauritius, they are sealed unless the people involved open them up and uh, you can only, you can only dis publicly disclose them under certain circumstances. And the only parties to this was Benjamin and Afrinek. So previously, the court documents could leak out to the press, to the rest of the membership, and so on, because there were lots of people involved. And cloud innovation has lots of allies and likes to brag about what it's done. And so um, the court documents became uh, public um, and, and readily available as a result of that. Now, we'll, like, we have no insight in how the Mauritian courts came to this conclusion, uh, what Benjamin was asking for, but mercifully in this case, the, um, the, uh, uh, the courts um, told, uh, uh, actually said that, uh, ruled against Benjamin's proposal. Um, so uh, against the proposal to, to uh, uh, appoint three directors call a, uh, and call it an election that way. So, um, but I know previously Eddie Kaihura, the former CEO, he had attempted something very similar, but he had gone with essentially an independently drawn up list of candidates, um, senior people, people that he did not necessarily see eye to eye with, um, and proposed that to the court as a, as a way to get out of this. So this is now before the receiver application. Um, so because the receiver thing is quite lengthy, you have to now wait for six months to call an election. So Eddie was trying to, to pull Afrinik out of its stall quickly and go, hey, uh, here's a way for us to reconstitute our board and get you know, jumpstart this engine, and the court struck that down too, didn't like it. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, uh, then uh, John Kiran explained that Eshun is believed to be seeking leave to appeal in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council of the UK. Because what happens when you reach a stalemate in Mauritius is you have to appeal to the UK. That's now the next step in this process of that avenue of attack. Um, but don't worry, that's not the only option and not the only way out of this Gordian knot. Um, uh, Kieran also warned that Ishun's case could take up to another two years to resolve that way. Um, and uh, that's the current status. I asked Benjamin for comment. This is what he told me. I'm just going to read it into, I'm walking away from the microphone the whole time. I'm very sorry to the people who are uh, watching online. Um, dear Jan, I regret to inform you that the matters in question are currently sub judice, and therefore I am unable to engage in any discussion or provide comments at this time. Thank you for your understanding and cooperation in this matter. Regards, Benjamin. So that's that. No, uh, no detail on why he did what he did, um, what he's hoping for, um, and whether indeed he wants to go to the Privy Council. So, now for the meat and potatoes. And uh, let me offer some options and some thoughts to hopefully kickstart a discussion about uh, how this might proceed. If I can, will forgive a jab. Um, so, dividing internet resources by geography, in my not so humble opinion, is incredibly dumb, but we're stuck with it. So there comes a stage where you have to put aside your idealism, realize the world you're living in, and pr pragmatically look and go, okay, this is, this is how things are for now. We can strive towards change, but we have to exist in the system now. What do we do? And so John Kiran explained that the uh, NRO, so there's like three different organizations um, that handle various aspects of number resources. Uh, on the internet. The NRO is one of them. NRO is like a, uh, is, is a gathering of the registries, right? Now the NRO has asked one of its sister organizations, the ASOAC, which is an ICANN organization. So those are the big guns, which is why ICANN's logo is on the screen. So ICANN is being appealed to here to uh, create a, uh, to flesh out the policy that governs RIRs regional internet registries like, uh, like Afrinec. And essentially, it's saying um, uh, the, uh, they've asked the AOCAC in particular, and this is now uh, uh, John Kieran saying something without saying something. They've asked the AOCAC to look at a policy to de-recognize RIRs. And so that to me is a shot across the bow. 
It's if Afrinek continues to fuck about, that's my one PG-13 fuck for the day. Um, uh, then the, the ultimate consequences could be that. You de-recognize Afrinik, you start up a new organization from scratch with policies properly thought out, with everything in place, um, with essentially a constitution underpinning um, the, the organization that, uh, so that policies can't be messed with at will um, and, and you start from scratch. But that is not an easy path either. Uh, for anybody who was involved in the dot Africa situation, um, when, like, invariably what's going to happen is there are going to be vested interests that are, uh, would, would be opposed to ICANN doing that. It will be taken to court and it'll have to be fought out there over several years. But that's a path forward. Um, and, uh, and so um, even though it'll most certainly involve legal action, um, at the end of the day, Afrinic 1.0 will cease to exist and Afrinic 2.0 will be put in its place. By the way, ASOAC, that stands for the Address Supporting Organization Address Council. I don't know why they have addressed twice, um, but uh, be that as it may, it's one of those acronyms. Now, um, the, uh, on the topic of pragmatism, there's also people who are like, listen, just consign Afrinic to the abyss. We don't need another RIR. Um, and uh, that's uh, tempting but not realistic. Uh, in a system where other RIRs exist, Africans have to have sovereignty over their number resources. It is essential. We can discuss that. We'll dis we'll, that, that is, this is me throwing thoughts out there for us to discuss. I'm happy to back it up later. So, um, in our discussion, I want to just also uh, throw this thing out there, which has really stayed with me since I've heard Mandela speak the words himself. Your duty is to work with human beings as human beings, not because you think they are angels, right? So, like, understand where people are coming from, understand the reality of the situation. So, um, let's think about corruption. Can it be eliminated? Is it worth expending the resources to eliminate corruption at its root? Or must we accept some level of graft so long as things work? And let me give two examples. There's, there's a functional difference versus someone scoring a sweet international trip versus someone scoring a slash eight, right? So that is something to think about. Sometimes pragmatism is more effective than enforcing a moral code. So instead of trying to catch corruption and weed it out and uh, punish people for, for example, accepting bribes to fast track your driver's license, um, uh, build it into the business model. That's, that's one option. Um, then the other thing I, I was, I was almost in two minds to, to bring this up, but Afrinic is deeply divided, and so is Afrinic, and there is incredible bigotry. Um, sorry, this was, uh, excuse the spacing issue, this was um, built in, in a different package than it's being displayed with. So um, this is just a basic overview of Anglophone and Francophone Africa with um, some of the other languages that make up our beautiful continent as well. And the reason I bring this up, as uncomfortable as it is, is because from the beginning, there was a deep divide in Afrinic along these lines, Francophone and, 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 and Anglophone. Um, and even though the cultures in those countries differ significantly and uh, people clash, um, uh, like what ends up happening is a uh, form of uh, tribalism. And so I am, uh, in the spirit of saying, uh, the, the uncomfortable truths out loud, I'm throwing this out there in the spirit of, of understanding the deeper problem so that we can build a, a sustainable solution. So, uh, and the reason I was hesitant to, to even go here is there's electioneering happening around the world and politicians love stoking our base tribalist instincts um, uh, for their own gain. Propaganda is more effective when you have an enemy. Um, but um, while we face the ugly truth, we might as well face the totality of it. Um, and, you know, perhaps uh, as I was thinking about this, I'm like, maybe at this rate, we shouldn't just have one RIR for Africa, if that's the way it's going to go. But also, I'm reminded, those lines are imaginary. The only meaning they have is the ones we give them.
Into RIR transfers, competition can be good. Other RIRs are doing this. Lots of members are asking for inter RIR transfers. That's where you move your number resources, your IPs, your AS, your whatever, to RIPE or Aaron or APNIC or wherever you want to go where um, you find things are more palatable for you. Um, but in a world of inter RIR transfers, how do we make sure Afrinic remains an attractive option? Um, because the thing is, for uh, a lot of the vested interests, they don't care if Afrinex is an attractive option. They just want security for their number resources. But the people who are going to solve this problem have to think through that. Then we have to seriously consider leaving Mauritius, which is another um, unpopular thing to say as Afrinex. We have to evaluate alternatives very carefully, though. You have to look at the stability of the country that you're going to put it in. You have to weigh the robustness and the independence of the judiciary. Um, you cannot have a situation where a Ghana Shea order is granted to an offshore company at own risk and perils. That's bad. You can't have a situation um, where the ultimate uh, decider, like if things deadlock, you appeal to the UK government. That's a problem. So these, these are things that, that need to be thought about when we think about permanent solutions. Um, then should litigation continue against cloud innovation and resource members like them? Should those resources be reclaimed? And so elsewhere in the world, things are a little, um, I want to say things uh, seem a little more forgiving in that sense. It's only if your organization collapses that the, that the number of resources get reclaimed. Reclaiming number of resources from someone who is still doing business, um, it's sort of thing. Um, is there a system to fix that? All right. I'm going to remind you of the Chatham House rule. And then I'm going to open the floor to questions, discussions, uh, and comments. Um, we are running quite late. Um, we extended the session a bit. So I think we can't have long discussion sessions. Lunch is already on the go. <laughs> but uh, I guess that there is an urgent need for some people to have a chat. So let's yes. try and keep them brief. I'm not going to go Let's into keep lunch. it on topic. I'm not um, going to go into lunch. The part and of the let's keep it we, we, friendly. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, part of the reason we chose the slot is so we can go into lunch. Uh, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to go have lunch. We'll, I'll be right here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let, let's do this thing. Hello, my name is Mark Elkins. Why am I here? I used to be a board member. I was a board member of Afrinic for six years. But I've also followed Afrinic since before its inception. I do think when you start with stolen versus cloud innovation, stolen as in uh, mem uh, employee number two stealing stuff, I think you're leasing, uh, you're, you're showing perhaps the flavor of the company, the organization, but I don't think that's cognizance of why we're here today, which is how to unfuck it. Um, why have I got, who is information out today? I have no idea. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Lu Heng's information was out of date, and as far as I understand, when he was told to update it, he told them to F off. Uh, that, that was there. Um, the, the official um, line from them was, oh, they went and checked, and there were a handful of records that were, but yes, point taken, but um, we, can, we can debate so he the, refused the relevance. To, he refused to update the information. That I agree with. Uh, I think at the end of the day, yes, he probably did use it for VPN usage. Um, and then if remembering that he's from Hong Kong, and initially Hong Kong wasn't, you could do things there, it was under sort of pseudo-British rule or stuff, stuff like that. And I think his biggest fear of admitting anything is that if he does admit that he uses it or used it for VPN purposes, he would probably get locked up. Uh, then murdered or something, I don't know, whatever. So obviously he's against his um, being killed or put into prison. Um, uh, I was chair of non-com at Afrinic for a long time on multiple sessions unless I was uh, actually trying to vote or something. And I can say that the, the voting systems that had, that were involved on membership being, or people being voted onto the board. I believe it was free and fair, apart from influences on people who had the opportunity to vote. 
I believe the systems that actually ran were correct. I didn't see any errors in it. Uh, there would be three people, whoever was ch chair of non-com, the CEO, and um, the law guy? Ashok. Ashok. Ashok were the three people that would unlock the system. Yeah. But so, I do believe it was fair. Okay, so, so let's pause there for a second um, because there's something I forgot to mention, um, which is that there was an incident where, and the policy still stands today. So previously there were no like major impediments to who can be appointed or who can stand for election. And at some point, those requirements were changed to you had to have attended a certain number of, and, and that, like, there were, so there's policy changes, uh, sorry, let me finish that thought. Yeah, sorry, full sentences, sorry. Um, so uh, there was a policy, policy change implemented where uh, suddenly you had to have attended three meetings. I'm sorry, I'm rushing because I'm cognizant of how much time. So all of a sudden, there's minimum requirements on who can, uh, who can stand for the, uh, for the election that weren't there before, and th the problem isn't that. Requ implementing requirements is not a problem. The problem is that they, they can be implemented on the fly and by the board without the members having any say on that. Um, and so that when I'm talking about problems with the elections that need to be fixed and why I believe a constitution is important, it's so that board members can't do that. Well, then I really am in the shit because I helped put that particular <laughs> thing in place because we wanted people who were interested in the organization rather than any Tom, Dick, and Harry uh, deciding that he was going to do a power play. Uh, technically, in the bylaws, and I checked it because I got it on my laptop, 13.8, auto reappointment of board members if there's no person that can actually take up, a new, new, no new person that can take the seat, then technically the previous board member is simply reappointed, and that simply hasn't happened for some wonderful reason, so there's something else going on in that organization. Um, 22.2 states that funds, if AFRINIC does fold, the funds, existing funds, uh, after any settlement, need to be moved to a similar organization, i.e. AFRINIC 2.0, hopefully. That was but very forward-thinking. We tried. Uh, and then uh, yeah, the problem with AFRINIC is the pricing is high always has been, but then I think that's also the case of any organization that gets created, uh, the, the, the CEO, et cetera, will try and extend the um, scope of that organization as much as possible so he, he can make as much money as possible. I use the word he, he, she, it doesn't matter. Yes. Um, those are the points that I, I came across. I, I am all in favor of Lu Heng. Please just keep that V4. We don't give a shit uh, because we're going to move to IPv6. We've got to move to IPv6 one day, and the sooner it happens, the better. Um, and I'll sit down now. Thanks. Great discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to go, yeah. Uh, I'll be quick. To you, um, Alan, and then to the, but you were first. Thank you. I actually asked my question out of line. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, you made a couple of statements. First yes. of all, thank you very much for the synopsis. Uh, I was a founding director of Afrinic. In those days, everything was going great. We were still doing just technical coordination. It really became a political organization that nobody wanted to be a part of. Vika and Pasani ended up being the representative from South Africa on the board of directors. And from then on, it was kind of questionable. And I still question all these things that you think could possibly be fixed up in a version two uh, I'd just like to point out there is a, there is a, another option, and that is that there is no registry for Africa and that Africans can go to Europe or Asia or America. And you didn't offer that as one other potential option. You just said how difficult it is to actually unfuck the current situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, that, that is an option, and um, my stance was um, that... I think Africa should have sovereignty over its resources. Now, that is not a universal view, um, but it is a political football. So yeah, we could go back to the old system where this part of Africa gets its resources from Aran, and this part of Africa goes to APNIC, and this part of Africa goes to RIPE. 
um, to, to get their resources. Um, but um, that is unpalatable for a number of reasons. And um, I, ideally, it shouldn't, be it shouldn't be regional at all, right? That's why I said I think it's dumb that it's geographic at all. But let's, let's get real about the, polit about the politics of this situation. It smacks of colonialism, right? That, let me just call a spade a spade. And that's why it's, it's uh, unpalatable for people. Hello, my name is Frank. I'm visiting from Tanzania. And I wanted to ask for a clarification of something that I, if I got it right, what you said. Um, when the applications for the allocations were made by cloud innovation for VMs, as we all believe, um, you said Africanic staff knew they were used outside Africa. Yes. But the VMs could be in Africa, potentially, as far as I know. Which yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the ultimate customer is in China. So, so accessing a VM that is in Africa with an African IP. Potentially an African IP, but it didn't have to be. Um, it could, uh, those, yeah, those VPNs IP. could terminate anywhere. Um, so he could, and um, it might be if you're trying to break out of the Great Firewall um, and you're offering a VPN service, uh, it might be a great idea to have servers all over the world. Um, and so, um, but yeah, the, the, the thing is, um, uh, based on, based on the, the, you know, the very credible testimony that I've, that I've heard, um, the fact is that whoever assigned these resources to cloud innovation knew from the beginning the end customer was people in mainland China. It was not Africans. Yeah, so that's the distinction I, I wanted to make. Thanks. Hi, uh, Sandal Stefan. Um, first, I want to mention I'm not an ethnic uh, uh, member. I'm from the Netherlands, uh, so um, don't want uh, 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 any colonialism. Uh, I'm very much <laughs> against that. Dude, my, my surname is Vermeulen. and guess what? I'm yeah, from. I, I know. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, so um, ha happy to help if requested. We'll not uh, give uh, unsolicited advice here. Um, but uh, the important thing is uh, I'm currently a member of the ASOAC that you mentioned. Cool. Um, so while I can't speak on behalf of the organization, uh, I'm not the chair, I don't have any power on my own. Um, so for all the official stuff, please go to the website. Um, I do want to say that we are taking uh, the uh, input of Africa very seriously in the whole ICP2 processes we are, uh, we are doing. Um, so the first question we got was to review a document written by the Executive Council, by all the CEOs. Um, uh, for that, that was a task we had to do, so we did that on our own. But then the follow-up task is to actually come with updates to ICP2. Yeah. Um, we are working on that. We're first establishing like the principles, what are the things we want, without going into all the, 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 uh, the details of the getting the right wording. Um, and after that, we will go to finally write the text. We will do uh, uh, rounds in all regions, so we will uh, ask the RAR staffs, including Efrenic, to do surveys or what they need to get input from this region. Um, we are also going to attend the RAR meetings, which Af Africa doesn't have at the moment. So we are looking at uh, options to do uh, things there online, so it's accessible for everybody. Um, and so we, we, we are trying to keep uh, uh, the African people We're not involved in the fight in Mauritius right now. Uh, get involved with the people who are trying to get Afrinic back on its feet, to, to get a, a, an election going, to get board members um, in place. Um, if, if your organization is not involved in that yet, uh, please chat to the people who are involved in that fight. And um, the, the more people can get involved, uh, to, to um, get that done and uh, figure out what's happening uh, with uh, the, the stay of the receiver and all that stuff, the better. Hi, Ian. Uh, yeah, Paul, I, I think it is right to disclose that I, I am Crystal Webb, one of the uh, parties who has an injunction. Um, in general, thank you for giving other people a really good synopsis. Uh, one area where I think I, well, there are two areas where I, I fundamentally disagree with you. One, I think you take far too charitable a view of John Curran. Um, I, I think there, there, there's quite a lot of problems there. Um, but the second thing is that, um, yes, there are things on which we should critique the Mauritian legal system. There are some really daft things with Mauritian courts, one of which is the way its sub-UDK jurisprudence is developed. It, it does pose problems, and I say that from the perspective that I can't tell you about certain things that are in court papers because Afrinic refuses consent for the matter to be discussed. So, uh, you know, t t take it from there. On the whole, though, the Mauritian legal system is 
manifestly well developed. And, you know, if you look at the, the guys running Dot Africa and so on, I don't know, with Zark rebranding, I'm not sure what they're called when they're in Mauritius, but they put their fundamental operations in Mauritius. People choose to be in Mauritius as opposed to other jurisdictions for very good reasons, which include the, the functioning of their courts. In this particular litigation, yes, some of the weaknesses in Mauritian jurisprudence really come to the center, and some of the problems within the way their courts operate come to the fore. But as a litigant in the matter, I can assure you that 99% of the reason why the litigation is dragging as much is because of the malevolence of people at Afrinic trying to drag the litigation across. And without going into the particulars of an application because of sub UDK, what I can, in, can state without any fear, because it, we, we've got the dismissals of is that one of the reasons why anybody who goes to court now and asks the court to appoint directors, which is provided for in, in the Companies Act, that application has to be dismissed by the court. And the reason it has to be dismissed is because Afrinic has opposed the first application to appoint directors so that the board is never in court. And it has no rational reason for doing so, other than that it was quite happy to drag into litigation. And, and that leads me to, to, you know, so thank you for the note. But I think one of the most powerful ways of ensuring that Afrinic does actually get from its fucked state into a, a less fucked state, because this isn't, you, you can't fix this sort of thing overnight. But it, there are two, one, one of two things has to happen. Either the legal representatives of Afrinic, or more importantly, the internal um, legal officer, needs to actually go to the court and say, listen, court, my, I have no faculty to operate on behalf of the company. As an officer of the court, I have to tell you this company is headless. Please appoint a curator ad litem. Please do something. You, you know, you, you, you express disbelief about how did Benjamin Eshan um, convince the courts that he's the chairman of the board when the court has already ruled. Well, no, because the papers come with an Afrinic seal <laughs> that is provided by the Afrinic legal director. Uh, so, so as long as Christian Dondi is prepared to go along with Benjamin Eshan, this matter is going to be litigated, because how does the court deal with it? So quite honestly, and I, I, I've expressed as much to him, but as far as I'm concerned, he has an ethical obligation as an officer of the court to inform the court of the, of, of, of the frailty of the situation and ask the court to appoint a Mauritian barrister as a curator ad litem. It, 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 it's you know, not usual in, in corporate matters, but there is precedent for it. And you know, again, I... I probably have to disclose I've, I've consulted on this quite, quite extensively. Or they could just withdraw their resistance to the appointment of directors pursuant to the original application. Now, of course, that's really good for my company. So I am you know, <laughs> saying, stop opposing my fucking application and, and, and you'll get a, get a board elected. Um, probably not the board that my company or associates want to elect, but that's irrelevant. So I don't think it's fair to at this juncture say that Lawfare, because again, if you, if you look at the list, it's, it's, there's, there's a good 30, 40 cases that Afrinic has experienced with, uh, what's it, Net Dynamics, whatever the, the, the guys, and Elad Cohen, and, and all that. Afrinic has won a lot of cases against parties which <laughs> legitimately ought to, to have taken across. But there is this insufferable arrogance that comes from the way Afrinic chooses to litigate. And whatever you may think of me or my company or Lu Heng or any of his companies or anybody else, we have to decide whether or not we believe in the rule of law. And if we believe in the rule of law, then we have to accept that there's going to be shenanigans. But legal shenanigans are easily overridden by Afrinic not being part of the problem. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Paul, your, your point is well made. Uh, th thank you for that. So, I'll I'll, I'll respond to that in a second, but before you launch into a TED talk, I want to I want to give another opportunity. But but I appreciate that. I think you've made your point well, um, and uh, we'll we'll come back to that in a sec. Thank you. I promise this won't be another lightning talk at the microphone. <laughs> uh, my name is Nishal. For some of you that know me, I used to be the CTO at Afrinic. I'm not speaking as an Afrinic ex staff member, but I'm speaking as somebody who used to be an operator of an internet service provider in the 90s. I know most of you in this room. I know how old you are, where your children are, where you've buried the bodies as well. So let me ask you, because I already know the answer to this, how many of you had more than a slash 19 in 1996? Yeah, I didn't think so, right? I mean, you know, aside from 
<laughs> Aside from like maybe three people that are sitting in this room, one of the founding reasons that we have an RIR for Africa is because there was recognition that policies that were used in other parts of the world were not necessarily applicable to networks in Africa. If you wanted, if you wanted an allocation out of Aaron in those days, as a, uh, and Aaron used to be the RIR responsible for us, you'd need to be able to justify a slash 19, which was a crap ton of space, and even with a much stronger RAND, a crap ton of money to network operators that were starting up then. One of the first things that Afrinic did, and this is not Afrinic doing anything, this is the Afrinic community, and that's you, by the way. One of the first things that happened out of the Afrinic community was that the minimum allocation for LIRs, ISPs, like yourselves, dropped to a slash 22. And if you look at the allocation schema and how it was, and, and how it was distributed to network operators in Africa, that improved dramatically after the start of Afrinic. I'm not here to tell you what you should think of Paul and Paul and well, you, you, Jan and whomever else is going to become the microphone, you can have your corridor conversations. But I want to remind you that policies that apply to one part of the world are not necessarily applicable to other parts of the world. So when you come to the microphone and make quite silly statements like we don't need or blanket will fit, that's simply not true. One size does not fit all. Otherwise, I would be crammed into a size 28 pair of trousers that would fit me wonderfully and you know, so would most of you as well. Uh, so not, not one size for everybody. Two, thank you for acknowledging Afrinic staff for actually being quite brave in this. I think that people here think it's Afrinic staff that are fighting against them. That's not the case. For those of you that don't know, the guy running around with the camera, I can't see him. Where is he? Ah, there he is. Avi. Avi is Afrinic staff. He's unknown to us from Afrinic because he's already good. He's good at AV and everything else that he does. So thank you, Afrinic, and thank you, Avi, for being here this week. Uh, and the third thing that I was asked to remind people about was that if you're a legacy resource holder, or a normal resource holder, obviously, you can still update your information in the Afrinic Who is database free of charge. There's this misconception that if you're a legacy resource holder, i.e. you got resources before the RIR system went into place, you can't go to Afrinic and update your information or any of the other RIRs. You absolutely can. And at least at Afrinic, they don't charge you for doing any of the stuff. So please, if you are a resource holder, a legacy resource holder in particular, you can update your information free of charge. Opinions? Lunch time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nishal. Hi, uh, Greg from the internet. Um, just one small-ish question. Um, the networks that have the, potentially the most to lose, I mean, in Africa, that's mostly the MNOs, but any of the big network operators, I know that one or two of them have kind of stepped up and got involved, but my sense is the vast majority of the really big guys are actually just not even caring. And in business leadership, I'm not seeing much interest in this issue. They're, it's kind of like, well, go to legal and ask them if they can write a nasty letter, and that's kind of where it ends. And is that the same as what you're seeing? Are, are the big guys just completely ignoring it and hoping it'll go away on its own, or what? Yeah, so I have to, I have to plead ignorance there um, because the, the companies um, that are involved are very private um, about their involvement. Um, and so, uh, but the sense I'm getting is that it, uh, it's the vast minority of resource members. And it's, um, so, look, honestly, uh, South African resource members make up a huge chunk yeah. of Afrinic. But it's the vast minority with, with people who, have, who, who care enough to have kind of stick their necks out and go, let's do something about this. Let's launch, you know, let's, you know, orchestrate the the um, official receiver application. So uh, uh, I'm going to agree with you, but with an asterisk <laughs> on that to say that um, I don't know what I don't know, uh, because uh, these guys um, don't want to don't want to talk about it if they if they litigate like that, unfortunately. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah and I think I've got a, a, just a comment on that. I mean, let's face it. Um, if you are prepared to stick your neck out on this, if you're a heavy resource, you know, if you're, you're a firm with you know, slash 16, if you're a large ISP, you have a fiduciary responsibility to your company not to needlessly get, get you know, stick your neck out. So the only, the only two, you know, groups of people that, that, you know, can really risk sticking their neck out on this, who, 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 you know, is either if you've got so much resources that your business, you know, that, your, your, that it becomes an absolute business essential, 
or if you're a small company with a small block and you're prepared to be brave and stupid at the same time. I mean, that, that's, that's the reality. I, I, I tend to disagree with you because the fact is that um, the MTN, Vodacom, um, uh, even Cell C, Telcom, they all need IPs. Yeah, but, but my point is that it's in their interest to do things privately. It's not in their privately interest. Privately, agree. W what I'm saying is, you know, th this, is, this is the conundrum that exists, which yeah. is that in order to do anything, especially to do anything publicly, you are taking a risk. You shouldn't be needing to take a risk, but the reality is that you are. So you either need to be very big and very prepared to bring out all of the guns that you've got and, and, and you know, then be accused of lawfare, or you've got to be small, brave, and stupid. Um, and I, 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 won't, uh, I won't say where, where, where I see myself in this, but I'm certainly not very big. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, with, with that, um, is there uh, anybody from CETA here or at the conference while I have the microphone? Um, if somebody from CETA is hearing this, please speak to whoever you need to speak to so you can reclaim the info plan block and vote. Please. Okay. <laughs> Guys, uh, I'm needing to get the venue cleared out so we can set it for the next venue. So after these last two questions, we have to close it. Continue the discussions over lunch, please. Thank you. Uh, otherwise, the um, hotel managers are going to come and like, try and attack me soon. <laughs> so after this, no lightning talks, quick questions to the point, please. Thank you. A uh, quick clarification on what you said just a while ago. People in the room should realize of Afrinic, one third of all resources, IP addresses, are held by people in South Africa. One third of all the revenue that Afrinic collects comes from South Africa. One third of all the membership in Afrinic comes from South Africa. South Africa has a big part in this, and we should be able to, just as one country, do something about this problem. Thank you. So I'm Andrew from the internet. Africa has a problem that foreigners come in and take the resources and they run off, and they use it outside of South Africa, and inside, well, outside of Africa, and the foreigners, every other country, Europe, the United States, Australia, is happy to use those resources to the detriment of Africa. That's what's happening here. Thank you for that comment. Um, uh, I, I don't quite follow, but um, appreciate your view nonetheless. Okay, folks, uh, that's, I'm going to close the session because we have been officially booted out. Thank you for your time, um, and I'll catch you over lunch and over beer. Uh, sorry, one item I was uh, asked to remind people of. The social this evening, there's buses going after the last session. Uh, there's going to be three buses, one every 15 minutes. Um, so once the session's finished, head to the bus, and you can go to the, the final, uh, to the, the social venue tonight.